Hi. So here is our final springtime, sort of springtime. Is it springtime? I don't know. End of winter <laughs> virtual coffee chat. I guess it's all been winter, come to think of it. Uh, and this one is with Alana Massad, and it's very exciting to me because I haven't seen Alana in a while, though we've been in touch uh, for many years now, actually. We met, uh, my, 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 my intro to people is very informal as to how I met them and why I know totally them. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, and what they think about me. Um, so it's, uh, well, first of all, in case you don't know who I am, I'm Julia Lee Barclay Morton. I'm an author. I wrote this book, The Mortality Shot, um, and a bunch of people blurbed it, including Alana, whose whose blurb got to the got to the front. <laughs> she she made the cover, um, and uh, it's a bunch of essays and short stories and a stage text about mortality. And the thing that I really loved about what Alana wrote about it is um, she talked about how it all wrestles with profound questions of compassion how to express it, how to direct it, and how to give it to oneself, both past and present. And Elena, along with being a wonderful author of a book we're going to talk about, and she's going to read from All My Mother's Lovers, which is amazing, really amazing. Thank you. <laughs> it, it came out at the beginning of the pandemic, so you might not have heard of it, but it's really good. <laughs> I just was like, that timing was... The That's timing was terrible. It was <laughs> yes. terrible timing, but it's a great book. So I'm like, please read this. Thank um, you. No, seriously, I love it. And... Um, we met at a place called Paragraph in New York, where it's a sort of writer's kind of warren, basically, is the best way to describe it, little cubby holes and silent spaces to write, um, which is great. I won't go anywhere near it right now because I still believe COVID exists, but um, <laughs> but it was beautiful at the time, and someday maybe I'll go back. And we uh, talked a lot. We There was this kitchen area, and we would talk a lot about what we were working on and how we did it. And... Mm -hmm. um, I knew you were working on novels. You knew I was working on this mammoth thing about my grandmothers, which still hasn't gotten published yet, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> but we almost did, but then COVID happened. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Just ate the publisher. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, right. Like yeah. Amazing... That was something yeah, that you know. happened to so many books, unfortunately. Yeah. It was horrifying. Um, but I mean, not as horrifying as COVID, mind you, but nonetheless. And but but you she started this wonderful thing called the other stories, which I don't know if you still do, but it's like a no. podcast. Okay, yeah. But it was for, for about five years I ran the other stories, which was a podcast that I mean the episodes are still all up. So the interview with you is still on Spotify, on iTunes, on you know, anywhere your podcasts are aired, not sold, I guess. Um yeah. and yeah, I remember uh doing the interview with you on um Janie and Dick Dick and Janie. Dick and Janie, yes. Yes. Yes, yes on your grandmothers. Yes. Yeah. Which was an amazing interview. And, and we we both one of the things we both um uh, kind of bonded on a bit was the imposter syndrome <laughs> that you you assured me was common <laughs> and I also felt odd because I'm older you know going back to writing for kind of prose and stuff from more theater stuff which is my comfort zone and mm -hmm. you know you were younger and there were a lot of younger people it was sort of this really interesting age thing and I feel like like we somehow transcended the, the generation <laughs> gap. Um, and I think because you, honestly, the reason I mentioned the compassion thing is I feel like what you've written about with All My Lo Mother's Lovers, which is obviously the work I know the best and some things I've heard before, but is compassion. I mean, and you write about it in relation to, in this book to mortality, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. So there is this incredible intersection and most people, you know, I mean, that's a silly thing to say in one way, but most people your age are not necessarily writing about that, let's say. Mm. Now, that's not necessarily true because I was, of course, and a lot of people are. So I'm not don't yeah. want to make a huge, weird generalization, but I, 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 it's just interesting, the intersection of, of these things. Um, so what I would like, if you're OK with it, Alana, is just if you'd like to introduce yourself a little bit more in detail and what. And if you want to then go into what what inspired this book, uh, that would be great. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. And thank you, Julia, for having me. Um, so I'm Ilana Massad. I am a, uh, a fiction writer and book critic. Um, and uh, fiction is sort of my first love, but I've come to really enjoy doing criticism work as well. Um, and this book really... Um, 
which is my first published novel, but uh, far from the first novel I've written, which I mention only because speaking to what Julia mentioned before about imposter syndrome, right? Like many people who publish, when they publish a book, that is not the first book that they've written. They've sometimes written one other, two others, four, five, seven, ten, you know. Um, so it's 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 just something to note because I think it's easy to look at someone who's published a first book and think like, oh, they did this thing, how amazing. And it is, but it's also like it, there was a lot of invisible work that comes before that and a lot of rejection and pain and, you know, uh, that sort of struggle. Um, so, yeah, so the inspiration for this book in particular was really, um, I mean, I've, it, my my response to it, I guess, to that question has sort of changed over time, but I think I'm retconning a little bit. I mean, originally what really inspired it was just the first sentence. So like I had this sentence rattling around my brain um, and, you know, I, it became what is still essentially the first sentence of the book. Um, and there's like four characters immediately in that first, in that first um, sentence. And so from there, I sort of started trying to figure out who are these people? Um, and why, what is the relationship? What are the relationships like? And what does this death, the book opens with a death, the book is about a queer woman named Maggie, whose mom dies. And Maggie goes home um, for the Shiva and then sort of runs away from the Shiva and um, starts trying to deliver these letters that her mother left upon her death. And so I was just sort of trying to figure out who these people were. And from there, the story slowly kind of unfolded. Um, but I think, you know, there's so much else, as you know, that goes into things. I mean, there's so much unconscious that goes into the conscious decisions, right? Um, and I think, for me, one of the unconscious things was, you know, that my dad died when I was 16. So, and I had all four of my grandparents died by then as well, all during my lifetime. And so I've had this sort of lifelong experience with death and dying and the people I love dying and being ill and, um, and caretaking, you know, and, and, and so I think I think it was that I came to this book in part to write both about grief um yeah to write about grief really um as i think probably the psychological space where it started yeah and and i think i mean just from what i know of the book and having read it, it it's it's so interesting because it's about that it doesn't i didn't know that actually about your dad somehow but it makes perfect sense because you know you, you have that I, I feel like the whole the whole thing about compassion and mortality and awareness and mortality are highly linked. Mm -hmm. And I feel that um, and also I think ableism and oh, yes. not having ableism and compassion are highly linked, you know, and, and mm -hmm. issues of invisible disabilities, which, you know, we share in different ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of that is like all related to understanding the complexity and and also just the the fragility of life quite frankly mm -hmm. you know i mean that that's something that most people don't really especially in this country want to really take a hard look at there's you know and in yes. fact when you read your excerpt it'll be all <laughs> about like trying to avoid it you know and and all, all the reasons why and you mm -hmm. know there's really who who wants to look at that uh, and yet somehow the looking at it or the experiencing it, whether you wanted to or not. And interestingly enough, as you may remember, it wasn't my father, it was my grandmother, it was Janie. I was with her when I was 16 mm -hmm. as she was dying. So uh, not right when she died, but a few months before. So mm -hmm. that's also interesting. There's something about that age and really confronting death and having it right in your face. That's like, I think it's quite um instructive <laughs> yeah yeah and i think especially in like a youth obsessed culture like the united states right the like we don't like to think about mortality in this country we we prescribe diets and cleanses and you know botox and just everything under the sun to avoid aging um on the one hand and so like I think all of that is to stave off the idea of death, right? Because we don't have very clear, I mean, especially, I was just talking about this over the weekend um, during a class, but especially um, like white America has very few mourning rituals, has very few kind of ways of dealing with death. Death is put aside, death is put in a room on its own. It's 
you know, elderly, the elderly are put into nursing homes, you know, like we, we don't like looking at mortality at all. Um, which is so ironic because of course it's like the only thing that we all share, the only thing that there is nobody on earth who will not experience it in some way. Yeah, no, it's true. And, and I, I, I was thinking about that exact thing and yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, I mean, we could keep going on, but I'm wondering if you'd be willing to read that excerpt. Um, sure. Because I think it's it speaks to this so beautifully. <laughs> sure, yeah, happy to. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and then let me know when your excerpt is going to happen. Uh, oh, well. I will, I will. Okay. <laughs> you go first. Okay, You're my okay. guest. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> okay, so this comes um, about 70 something pages into the book um, and just some names that are important um, so as to follow along with the scene is Iris is the mother. So the way that the book works is there's the contemporary um, present tense narration that is about Maggie uh, sort of confronting her grief. And then there are flashbacks to um, I, from Iris's perspective. Um, and so I think I'm just checking to double check. So uh, let's see, I think. Oh, P and Peter is um, Iris's husband and um, Maggie's dad. And Maggie has a brother named Ariel. So I think those are the only names that really matter. Oh, whoops. All right. Iris, June 2nd, 2013. Iris rarely considered her death a real possibility, perhaps because she spent much of her life making sure to avoid it. It was one reason she read detective novels, crime novels, all the literature she could get her hands on that explored the bloodiness and depravity and confusion of the worst of human nature. By being aware of it, of all its infinite, if predictable, as she discovered over the years as she devoured more and more such books, possibilities, Iris was able to feel in control. In restaurants, she sat with her back against the wall or at a corner table far from the windows. During air travel, she sat behind the wing, even when she could afford the occasional business class seat, because she'd read that you have more chance of surviving a crash in the back half of the plane. If she'd ever needed to take a, bu a long bus ride, she was sure she would have looked for the seat belts. She drove carefully, never more than five miles above the speed limit. She double, she double locked motel and hotel room doors, added the chain if there was one. And because she wasn't one to dismiss harmless superstition, she wore her amber necklace handed down from her mother where, whenever she had to travel farther than a five mile radius from her home. But soon after Iris turned 59, she had a fall. That's all it was, a fall. She was walking along Abbott Kinney in Venice where she just met a prospective client for lunch and was pretty certain she was going to get the job. It had been a nice meal, perfectly pleasant. She and the prospect, the owner of a, of a chain of co-working spaces, discovered they'd both gone to the same temple back when she lived in LA and might have crossed paths. He knew her friend D Dina, not well, but he liked her. She'd recommended a decorator that he and his wife ended up using. And they had fun playing Jewish geography, trying to see who else they might both know, whether they'd lived near each other or had relatives who did. She wanted the assignment, even though it meant going up to Sacramento a few times, which would be sad. When they finished, the prospective client insisted on paying, implied she'd probably be charging him expenses soon anyway, and shook her hand before handing his ticket to the valet. Iris had found parking on the street and she walked toward her car, hoping there wouldn't be unexpected traffic on her way home. And then she fell. It was a tiny jut in the sidewalk that tripped her and she only got a small run in the pantyhose she was wearing. Her hands were a little scra scraped, stinging without bleeding, but the moment in which the concrete rushed toward her had felt endless and her body's reaction hadn't been instantaneous like she was certain it should be, like she was sure it once was. Instead, her body froze, her reaction slowed, and she thought she was about to die. Lady, are you okay? A white guy with dreadlocks had a hold of her elbow and helped her up. He was her height, but he seemed to be gazing down at her, and she imagined how he must see her as a middle-aged, no, probably old if she was being honest, woman, silver-streaked hair, frail, even though she never pictured herself this way, never felt this way. Ma'am, he pressed, looking concerned, if stoned, and when she said she was fine and thanked him, he nodded and said, well, be careful, Leo, and walked away, his dread swinging behind him as he approximated a sloped and sideways walk. 
She thought of Abe, of the stories he told her about his son and their bickering over things like cultural appropriation and fashion. Abe rolling his eyes and saying that there were more important things in the world than white guys wearing dreads. His son trying to tell him that that wasn't the point, that many things could be important at once. She'd never mentioned it to Abe, but whenever he talked about his son, she thought the teenager would get along with Maggie. They seemed to share an indignation with the world that she couldn't muster in the same way anymore. She missed Abe. She wondered if she'd ever conveyed how grateful she was to him and how much she appreciated their time together. She missed all of them, really, all the important ones, except Shlomo, of course. She fiercely missed Peter in that moment after the fall and made herself start moving again so she could get to her car and back home to him. Her body was stiff, as if still seizing up on the way down. Nothing had happened to her, but she felt like something had changed irrevocably. She was faced with the fact that her body wasn't going to be getting stronger. She should be getting more calcium. She should get a bone density test, a physical. She'd been neglecting herself for years, thinking she was going to last forever on sheer willpower. This small fall, a stumble, an uncharacteristic slip in her never before clumsy life reminded her she was mortal and aging. In the car on the way home, she tried to calm herself. After all, she'd had some existential moments when she started going through menopause years ago, but mostly she'd been worried about her sense of desire back then, concerned that with her, homo that with her hormon hormonal changes, she would also feel less of the lifelike substance that was her sexuality. She'd been relieved to find that while certain bodily functions worked less vividly than they used to, for the first time in her life, she'd begun using lubricating substances besides condoms. Her desire remained. Now, she didn't even care about her desire, the fear coursing through her instead, instead entirely devoted to the time she had left on Earth. On a whim, while stuck in traffic on the 101, she tried calling her daughter, but the call went to voicemail and she realized it was almost four in St. Louis and Maggie would be working. Ariel was on a week-long trip with some buddies of his, attending an amateur Magic the Gathering tournament, and she'd see Peter soon enough. She called Maggie again and left her a message. Hello, darling, it's mom, she began in her sing-song phone voice. I just wanted to see how you are. She considered telling Maggie that she'd fallen, but decided against it. What else could she say, though? Oh, and I watched the first part of that documentary you recommended about the West Memphis Three, and, you know, those boys really were railroaded, weren't they? Imagine if someone had seen how you dressed in high school and decided that meant you'd done something terrible. Anyway, I'm rambling. Stuck in traffic. I'm sure you never miss that in Missouri. She slurred the word the way Maggie did when she was making fun of the local accent. Anyway, love you. Bye. It's mom, if I didn't say that before. Okay. And she hung up. She wondered sometimes why talking to Ariel always seemed easier. They had more in common, she supposed, in that they were avid readers and could talk about books for hours. They read wildly different genres, usually, but would occasionally read one of the other's favorites so they could talk about it. But it wasn't just that. It was something to do with privacy, maybe. Ariel was the one with the lock on his door, but Maggie's heart and mind were closed books, and she was independent enough not to open them unless she wanted to. Iris envied her daughter sometimes for being able to seize at her own strength so soon, so young. She'd started insisting on wearing what she wanted to nursery school when she was four. She told Iris firmly that she had no interest in ballet when she was seven. She'd come out to friends at school before telling her parents. Mostly, Iris was proud of Maggie and a little bit of herself for managing to raise her to be this person. She wasn't sure her daughter recognized their similarities or how lucky she was to have had her independence encouraged, but it didn't really matter. If Maggie were to ever have a child of her own, surely she'd set a good example in other ways and also not receive credit for it. Iris wasn't sure she would. As far as she knew, Maggie wasn't interested. And if she was, well, Iris couldn't help but worry about a child raised without a father. She could, always, she could almost hear Maggie yelling at her just at the thought. She wondered if it was too late for them. She hoped not. When she got home, she entered Peter's office, but he was on a video call and would, could only glance up at her and half smile in the midst of his chatter about banner widths and necessary resolution. She went to the bedroom and rolled off her pantyhose and took off her skirt and blouse and got into her comfy home clothes, the yoga pants and overlarge t-shirt. Last of all, she removed her necklace. She fingered the raw amber in its setting, bought by her grandfather long ago and given to his youngest daughter, Iris's mother, who wore the jagged edges smooth with years of worrying it. She gave it to Iris when she married Peter because, she said, Iris had finally given her nachis and she didn't have to worry about her anymore. 
It was only after her mother died, though, that Iris turned it into this into the regular companion it became. It had somehow felt like tempting fate or the evil eye to wear it before, like stealing her mother's luck before it had run out. Iris stared at the mirror, at her face that looked no different than it had that morning, but which seemed to symbolize a whole lot more. The crow's feet, the way her lips were, were grooved all over, the loose skin below her cheeks that weren't quite jowls, but implied them. She had to write a will, she realized. It was time. She was sure she and Peter had some boilerplate thing, probably made when the kids were little, but she needed to write something proper. She needed her children to know she loved them. Come to think of it, she needed everyone she'd loved to know it. Great. <laughs> it was so fun rereading that <laughs> today. I think it's just so beautiful. And I, I love, um, you know, just, just like how this kind of moment then just changes everything. Like suddenly now she wants to do a will and now she's worried about all the people who love them. And I believe presumably that's when she begins writing the letters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, which that's part of the book too, that, I, you know, you may want to talk about, but it, which is also interesting because what also happens in the book is the daughter Maggie ends up learning a whole heck of a lot about her mother that she did not know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's also interesting that that she starts thinking back to that. So I don't know if you I I just wonder, wonder if you want to tell people a little bit about that, too. Yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of the plot, you know, um, part of what Maggie learns very early, which, you know, is in the in the title of the of the book is that um, her mother has had lovers throughout her marriage to her father. Um, and I think that that's something part of why I wanted to write that was, again, speaking to what we talked about before with a sort of youth obsessed culture, um, I I'm very lucky to be very close to my mother. I'm very different than Maggie in the book in that way. Um, and I've seen sort of the ways that over the years, you know, age has not changed her, but it's changed how she notices people looking at her and it changes how she feels in public um, in all of these ways. And, you know, I've heard women of varying ages talk about this in so many forums, right? Like the idea that either you become invisible or you become, you know, you, you, you become, if you're in Hollywood, right? Like the minute you turn 40, you're suddenly playing grandmothers, right? I mean, like, it's insane the way, the sort of weird expectations of youth that we have for women. Um, and I think that one of the things that isn't discussed enough is the fact that like women, it, it, people, people can have desire for their entire lives you know like desire doesn't disappear the minute that hollywood has decided that you're no longer attractive because you're over the hill quote unquote right like and so that's part of what i wanted to have is like this this fiercely independent lesbian woman maggie needing to come to terms with the fact that her mother was also a sexual creature and a sexual being and had and lived out her desires and to yeah. me, I guess also sex and death are very like connected in that way, <laughs> yeah. because, you know, the sex drive and the death drive, you know, there's some Freudian stuff going on there, but also because obviously, you know, sex is what brings life. So of course it has to be connected to death because all life dies. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> there's no way out of that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. No. And I just love to just that, how, you know, dealing with her, you know, her own, you know, and Maggie's own ageism and then realizing what she's thinking. And, and uh, you know, so she was dealing with her mother's fears about her being gay. But then on the other hand, you know, she has to confront her own ageism and, and all of that and all the other things that go along with it and identity confusions and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. It's great. And I and I just, you know, just that whole idea that sometimes it is when somebody dies that you find out more about them or something yeah. occurs, you know, and you find out more information. Um, I've certainly had that experience a couple of times. Uh, and in terms of the desire thing, my grandmother, Janie, as you well know, because <laughs> you know about the, she never gave up on it. In fact, I have a whole piece in Oldster, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, buttons. Um, Surrey, Surrey buttons, yes. Buttons, amazing. Yes. Um, 
sort of Substack magazine about, you know, about this article she wrote about sex over 60 in the 70s, which was yes. like completely unheard of, like at that point. And mm-hmm. of course, she couldn't get anyone to publish it because like she thought hilariously, she thought like Playboy or something would publish it. And of course, they have no interest in women as sex. They just wanted women as objects. And I think it was I, it, it, but incredible that she did. And I was so glad that that's somebody. Luckily, I have all of her stuff, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah. and I think it's something that we are starting slowly now. I mean, you know, in, in yeah. the last decade, the fact that like, you know, uh, Grace and Frankie as a TV show yes. even existed, you know, the fact that there were yes. conversations in that show about what lubricant to use, you know, like, well, and they these were are making things. It. Yes, they were making it right. Um, <laughs> because they wanted it to be natural, right. <laughs> but <laughs> that, you know, that couldn't have existed. Right. You know, um, although I suppose to be fair, I'm not a devotee of Golden Girls, but I have heard that there's a lot of <laughs> more oblique, but still very clearly raunchy stuff in that show. So I'm just not as familiar. <laughs> Probably there is. I actually don't know it at all, to be honest. So I'm not, I, I like, I, I just, there was a whole, like a couple of decades where I watched no television at all. So I had no like references in that zone at all. And I just have to admit it. <laughs> But I think what I'll do actually is just go to my excerpt too, because I think it, it just, they, they kind of, they intersect really well. And I think it'll just add to the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, some of you've been here, you've heard me read from a lot of things. What you haven't heard is, uh, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's way too long, um, is an essay I wrote a, called Dragonfly Time about when my cousin died and she died in her fifties. Um, and I was uh, lucky enough to get, to her before she died and she was sort of in an in-home hospice situation um dying of of breast cancer way too young she was only 51 um just breaks my heart and she was um also a granddaughter of Janie the grandmother I just told you about and I'm not sure if that comes into this section but I think you know it's just so we shared this really interesting history and she had three brothers uh, but they're all brothers and I have no siblings. And so um, except much later in life, step siblings, and I just don't know them that they're fine, but they're just not, you know, whatever. And um, so, so this is, so she's the closest I had to a sister. And um, so anyway, I'm just going to talk about being with, this is basically about the night and some reflections beyond that, that I was there, which was about a week before she died. Um this last night with Dee, though she seems happy to be telling me about the progress of her wily cancer that she has grown to respect as it had invaded her bones first when it reappeared and then her organs. The cancer has now wended its way into each little part of her body. She is impressed by its intelligence. She spends an hour or so explaining its course, how it has invaded this and that treatment, somehow hidden out in one corner and then grown stronger like some rebel troops in enemy territory, feeding on what is trying to kill it. She tells me she got the genetic disposition, which also killed her mother and aunts from, quote, the German side of her family. She frowns. I never did like them. You breathe an internal sigh of relief because her father's side is not to blame for that anyway. Dee tells me she's afraid she's not dying right because of the pressure she feels to have a good death. I tell her she's dying just fine, and we both laugh. We laugh a lot that night, talking like we have all the time in the world. I do not want to lose her. No one can replace her. I will be so alone, a floating electron, untethered. You are losing her anyway. Dee had tried to work earlier that day, a week before she will die, on a grant report for community health care. She's worried about her family's health and health care insurance. Ironically enough, given her job is for the state working on public access health care, afraid if she does not work enough days, she will lose it and how that will affect her husband and boys. Dying in America is a treacherous business. We're both sitting on the sofa now. She sits up to go to bed, but then Jay goes into the kitchen and she wants him to walk her to the bedroom. While I'm sitting next to her waiting, she says, This will be the last time we see each other. I nod in a fugue state of intimacy and denial. But maybe that's okay, she continues with a slight smile. Dragonflies only live a few days. Did you know that? 
They have to mate and have dragonfly babies all in that short time. She frowns again, looking at you intently, eyes widening a bit as if surprised by her own thought. When do they have time for themselves? Memory gets wobbly here. Did you cry, laugh, make a joke, stay silent? I can't remember. I do remember that I knew exactly what she meant, that her whole life had been about serving others, whether it was politically or with her community health care work or making a home with her husband and boys or taking care of her own mother when she was dying of breast cancer only 15 years ago, just a few years before her own diagnosis. The only time I remember her taking time for herself was right after her mother died, when she took a couple hours off a day to go sit in a park and write in her journal. And even then, she told me that many of her friends did not understand her need for quiet time asking her, especially since she had little children. Wasn't that selfish? I will never understand the Lutheran core of Minneapolis, St. Paul. When she told me this back in the relatively happy time before she had begun her own battle with breast cancer, when we could have leisurely phone conversations about the nature of life and the uncanny similarities born of blood connection and sharing a feminist, rebel, alcoholic grandmother, I pretty much wanted to throttle those so-called friends. But the dragonfly is my favorite, Dee says now, so ancient and regal, but so small hovering, delicate and strong. I loved when they would land on my arm when I was little. You don't want her to fly away. But when she dies, a few days later, when I'm back home in New York City, I'll see Dee in my mind's eye vividly and she's dancing. She loved Aretha Franklin. We joked about how good the music was gonna be in the afterlife, especially since the Queen of Soul had just died a week earlier. Dee appears now happy and carefree in a way I never saw her in life. I will find out months later at her memorial that she was often like this with her friends. The overwhelming consensus of the over 400 people at her memorial will be that nothing was as fun without Dee. There are so many photos of her smiling. Am I the only person with whom she talked about her darker thoughts and feelings? But that seems impossible. However, the only people surrounding her in those last days, with the exception of her in-home hospice nurse named Astonishingly Janie and me, were men. All loving, generous men, her husband, brother, and two boys, but men nonetheless. What was she not saying to them or to anyone else? In one of his blog posts after Dee's death, Jay says he destroyed or somehow disposed of her journals as related to him without reading them. He writes that he believes she would have wanted them private. But would she have? You wonder, did you ask? A part of you shrieking internally, why didn't you give them to me? Is this selfish, intrusive, prurient, or just a writer who wants desperately to understand private, so often hidden away in journals, female experience, especially Dee's? Having once again evaded bedtime, Dee is now scrolling through her phone's playlist, talking to Jay about what music the band will play at her memorial. They discuss and sometimes disagree about who should play what song. Jay plays in various local bands and the musicians will be friends of theirs. You are in the room during this conversation, but it's like you're somehow here and not here, a privileged moment of seeing a kind of intimacy between them. They both reference passwords and going through papers, none of which will happen. This is what I have learned about death, having witnessed it up close a number of times. No one is ever prepared for their own death. No one, ever. No matter how many conversations or ideas about what to do or not to do or healthcare proxies or wills or lack of wills or whatever, there is no perfect way to die. The obverse and yet correlative is that there is no perfect way to live either. And maybe if we could accept that, everyone would be a little more forgiving of ourselves and each other. Dee was my cousin. Cousin seems and seemed so small a word for what she was and is to me. But through her blood coursed the blood of Janie, with whom we shared certain traits like permanently raised eyebrows and intelligence that radiated from her skin. But Dee was kind of like her mother. I inherited Janie's bloody mindedness and ruthlessness in pursuit of a voice and life, which has cost me many relationships for good or ill, as it had also cost her. But the irony is 
Dee told me numerous times that she felt the same way, too selfish and not good enough, and that she was dying and mothering in the wrong way somehow, always. We both inherited a sense that nothing we did would ever be enough, that any decision we made was lacking, because we were somehow meant to be everything and all at once. When I told her I was pregnant back in 2007, I saw, before she quickly masked it, a look of horror on her face. I was 43. Perhaps the look related to the fact that she never felt like a good mother, though she was, and somehow not bonded enough with her children. But what I saw was the look of someone who is terrified that I would lose my freedom to create. That look pierced you to the core like an icicle freezing you from the inside. The day after the wedding, I miscarried at 12 weeks. And some part of me wonders if my body rejected the fetus in that moment with D. I stopped feeling morning sickness around that time as friends and family were gathering for my second marriage in London. You are writing these words a year after Dee's death on West Stray, an island in the Orkney archipelago, in a manse you discovered when collaborating on a project that would not have existed if you had carried that child to term. In your zeal to add a happening, happy ending, even on top of the worst shit, you wonder now, was finding West Ray my consolation prize for losing my last chance to be a mother? And the creativity I find here, the focus and drive, is this the gift? This is the island sanctuary I discovered after the Peaks Island Cottage where I had spent time with Janie when she was dying was sold because no one could afford the taxes. One of the last times I saw that cottage was with Dee, who had come to the memorial for my fourth father in 2012. We met the new owners and their two little girls happily squirming on the sofa, who were the age I was when I had first discovered the two flat-surfaced Ice Age boulders below the cottage, where I had sat on many summer days, daring the waves from the Atlantic to douse me. I told Dee I had named them Mommy and Daddy Rock. We lay down on them, feeling their warm, stable surface, our skin refreshed by the spray of the crashing waves. Ah, so there. I'm glad I made it through without sobbing. That was good. <laughs> um, anyway, I don't know if you want to respond to that first before I say anything. Or... Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's interesting because you talk here about someone dying as well as this potential birth or this potential new life. Um, but I think one of my favorite lines in this whole piece is just that that early in the piece where you say that uh, where your narrator is like she's dying just fine, that you tell her that she's dying just fine. Um, and I think that's so much that just says so much about your relationship, right? Um, that you are able to make that kind of joke and have that kind of conversation. Um, and it's also just I mean, I, I feel like I really like Dee just from knowing the very few things that I know about her through the essay. She seems like so wonderful, um, but also so heartbreaking because of sort of this. And I mean, I feel like that's a lot of what your book is doing in general is like this sort of push pull between the internal, the way that you feel inside and the things that are bursting to come out of you, not just you, but like women sort of in general. Um, and and girls also i mean because there's also a lot about girlhood and, and child childhood um in a couple of the stories but it's sort of that 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 need for the self to express to live to be big right to take up space versus that feeling of needing to uh well sorry i almost ripped out my headphones um uh that feeling of needing to caretake or needing to be small and contained and and die correctly so that you're not bothering anyone, you know? I mean, there's just, there's something so indicative and like, it just says so much, the idea that you, this woman who was full of life wanted to die right. Um, yeah, so I, I just, I really love this piece. And also, I mean, I think uh, when I think about dragonflies, there's the moment where you say, er again, early-ish in the piece that like, they're so ancient but also so fleeting. And I think I only recently learned that dragonflies are like one of those actually really, really ancient creatures. And they used to be like huge, you know, like big flowers also used to be like as big as a room, which is just so bizarre to try to picture. But um, 
you know, but dragonflies that are used to be huge, but are now like very small, right? And what, I guess I was just thinking about like how that relates to this sort of bigness of spirit, but smallness of fitting into a social role. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, if I was ever to rewrite the uh, essay, I'd probably add some of that in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, because it's true. And and exactly that, like her, you know, she did has and, and raised these amazing boys who are doing amazing things now. And her husband is great. And, you know, so she had a great life. It wasn't a horrible life. But she was so and, and other people, it was really interesting, not just her when I got pregnant, were a couple of people were very invested in my work and making sure I could keep going in that. And and there was this, and also when I had another pregnancy that's mentioned in there, it's a whole other scene, you know, very nervous about my losing that. And, and it's sort of interesting because uh, that came from women who had raised kids, you know, this mm -hmm. wasn't some abstract thing. Uh, whereas people who didn't have kids were like, oh, that'll be cool. And you can do that and all the things. And the women who did have kids were like, I'm not so sure. <laughs> you know. So right. it is also very interesting, like that whole issue of bringing life into the world and, and what kinds of life we bring into the world and mm -hmm. what's important. Um, yeah, because, yeah. you know, there's that whole thing where that I personally don't connect to this kind of metaphor, but people often talk about birthing a book or their book baby right and i think there's a way that that is sort of relevant to other art forms too right like that your creative endeavor is a kind of birthing um that metaphor for me doesn't feel quite right but like did you ever feel that way about like your creative work like did it feel to you akin to or or was that metaphor useful for you at all it's a Good question. I, I don't know, you know, because I've seen what it's like to actually have, I mean, I, I have friends with children and, you know, I, I see that a lot. Um, and so it's clearly different. Do you know what I mean? It's clearly not the same thing for a lot of reasons. Um, I think I feel a fidelity with my work, if that if that's the right word, um, mm. or so, some kind of, I feel like, that, and the biggest problem with not having children, I've talked to other women who haven't had children, either by choice or just by accident of timing and a mixture of things. And in my case, it was choice for a while, then it wasn't, and it went back and forth. I was very mm -hmm. ambiguous, to be honest, the whole time about it. Yeah. I was really am highly ambiguous. I was not like, yay, you know, um, <laughs> it, it was like, okay, I think. And, um, uh, oh, and we all have said that, you know, the one thing that's really hard is you end up feeling, at least if you're a creative person, a huge pressure that you've got to like write a Nobel prize winning piece of literature because you haven't had a child, damn it. You know, so it's sort right. of like, well, I didn't do the thing you're supposed to do. So the other stuff I do better be great, you know? Right. Uh, right. As yeah. if that's like even a measure. Right. I mean, like, well, I mean, obviously it's absurd, but like, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah right, of right. course. I mean, and yeah, that's so interesting. Cause, cause you know, men usually don't have to choose, right? Like they can write their Nobel prize winning work and have kids and can even be considered really great fathers, you know? Um, I mean, I think about someone like John Irving, who's an author I really love, um, and who was doing all sorts of really interesting work at a time when, you know, it was sort of taboo um, that still holds up surprisingly well. Um, it's true. But, you know, I, I knew <laughs> one, of his, one of his kids and I were in the same year at college, um, and he was a really lovely kid. It was from his, I think, from John Irving's second marriage. Um, and I mean, he was a young man at the time, you know, like we were both 19 or 20 or whatever. And he was really lovely. And he also would say that his father was his favorite author, which I thought was like really sweet and also made me think that like, we should all read more because um, <laughs> we shouldn't, it, that's too easy to have a favorite author. Um, but I was thinking about how like this man, you know, had this whole, I mean, I remember my mom telling me about how John Irving uh, in, you know, when she was young, he was sort of like the hot author, right? Like he would appear, he was like one of those public intellectuals. So he would be on like TV talk shows and he wrote some risque things and like he was a boxer. So he was very manly, you know, like that was a whole thing of his, but it sounds like he was really a, like good to his family and like his kids love him and stuff. And I wonder like how 
what does that mean? How much, how much did he have to be a present father and how much did he not have to be a present father in order to be a good father, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so I guess it's just, it's interesting the sort of the, the sacrifices that women are assumed to need to make. Yeah, and I'm seeing some interesting um, stuff here in the chat uh, too that I'm wondering whether we want to engage with. Um, so first, what Anita says here is, I wonder if the idea of dying right is typical of dying. I wrote in my journal about reasons for maintaining sobriety. I must be present in order to die well. Uh, your conversation is fascinating. I'll read your novel, Ilana. Good, Anita. Good, good Thank you, Anita. <laughs> um, and, and if you want to, when we get officially to the question and answer session, which will be soon, we, you can elaborate on that. But there's that. And then Catherine also said something lovely, which is, I don't connect to that metaphor either, the book baby thing, but I'm amazed how many people I personally know have given birth to a child and debuted a book in the same year. I know. I have no idea what that is about. Something there for it's sure. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do wonder about their financial setup, I must confess. I do have of course. I, I, I have I have class radar. <laughs> so like I don't know. I mean, maybe they're maybe they're just miracle people and they can do it all. Um, but I wonder what kind of help they have or what kind of person they're married to and what kind mm -hmm. of financial, you know, because I have found in a lot of these cases, not all, but in many cases, uh people who do these miraculous things um tend to also have some finances. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, and I mean, I, I that mean, also feels ultimately very related to death and dying, right? I mean, we know that there are differences um, across class in how and when people will die, right? Um, like none of these things are ever isolated. No, exactly. And the fact that Darcy, I mean, she really was worried that her family would lose their health care. I mean, she worked in community health care and yeah. she was worried that if she stopped worrying, I mean, she worked until about three days before she died, okay, yeah. of breast cancer with chemo. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, that's psycho. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. country is psycho. Oh, yes. I mean, and, and it's like, and and she was, I mean, they were right up to it. I mean, they were good at what they did all, and, and her husband had a, he was managing to work from home so he could care for her, but like he didn't have, you know, a lot of stability that, you know, so they were just, it, I mean, it's amazing they did what they did, but like the amount of balancing they had to do with mm -hmm. not a lot of funds, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a great unstated actually thing about literature in general. We have talked about publishing and all the things is connections and privilege and how things mm -hmm. get out there. And that's something people don't want to talk about a lot because it makes people kind of, kind of. You know, hanky. I mean, I think we should talk about it, but yes, <laughs> I agree. I, yeah. I do all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. actually, I've just, I've just turned right into that curve in my memoir about I've changed. It's like about autism, late diagnosed autism, ableism and class. I'm just yeah. like going right at it. I'm going yeah. right yeah. at it because I'm so sick of it being this thing that's like, we can't talk about that, you know, totally. Like, oh, totally. hell yes, we can. And, and like you said, it, it relates to mortality because it relates to how close to the bone you are and mm -hmm. what you can do and what you can't do and how much you can pull off and why and mm -hmm. you know yeah i mean i'm even just thinking of like you know the the railroad disaster in east palestine right in ohio oh and God. how those people are expected to just go back and live under toxic waste so like you know presumably this means it's as dark as it is to think about it this way right now but that means that all of these people are probably going to die quicker <laughs> Yeah, you know, than absolutely. people living three towns away that aren't, you know, and it's just, yeah, there's so much about death that is so beyond our control, obviously, but like, there are so many things that are beyond our control for the wrong reasons, just like yeah. with writing, right? Like, yes, of course, <laughs> there's so much in writing and publishing that is beyond our control, right? People's tastes vary. People, I, something that I tell people like that when I'm reading, Something I tell people who are worried about like submitting things and like, well, why do I keep getting rejected? And if I think the work is really good, right? Like I'll remind them that as someone who's done a lot of reading of submissions, so much is about the person's mood. You know, like literally mm -hmm. if someone is hungry and it's near lunchtime and they're reading the last four submissions before they're gonna go have lunch, they might be reading them really quickly and disinterestedly. And they're just like, I'm hungry, I'm in a bad mood now. And that's why they don't take a thing, right? Like mm -hmm. sometimes when I think about how everything human beings do is so um, 
so fragile, like all of the systems that we have that are made up of people and all of their fragilities, it sort of is shocking that society has any working parts at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> no, and I think that, you know, and honestly, that is part of what you hopefully I, I think I address and you I definitely address and you're not I mean, yeah, I don't want to presume but I, I feel like we're both kind of addressing that fragility in different ways in our very different books, you know, and and I think that's um. It's like if you're going to address the human condition such as it is or isn't, you know, you have to address that and and that ironically again like you said about mortality it's like that's the one thing that does tie us together now when mm -hmm. we die and how and what and again okay back to that thing with the East Palestine thing what's incredible is people are like why don't they just leave well they can't afford to right. like that's the thing like some people did just leave because they were renting or whatever so they could but other people like have a mortgage of four hundred dollars it's one woman she's four hundred dollars a month is her mortgage where the hell is she going to go to pay four hundred dollars a month and she's not selling that house because it's in a toxic waste zone so right. it's like this <laughs> idea that people are supposed to make these choices like this is also something that drives me nuts is when people think that choices are are all available to everybody and it's like yes. honey no <laughs> yeah 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 no it's not that simple some people actually are stuck you know and i think that's something where the ableism kicks in or the classism or the ableism or the mixture is just this idea that like no everybody should just get up and go you know mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like that would be great you know if you want to yeah it. oh i mean i think if everybody had the choice to just move when they needed to be safe when they needed to you know, not get attacked in the street, not be discriminated against by doctors. We don't make that choice. You right, know? Exactly, it's just that those exactly. choices aren't really ours in a lot of these cases. Right, exactly. And which goes back now, now having circled back to something. Um, uh, oh, see you, Corinne. Thanks for coming. Um, that when, um, what was I going to say? Yes, that that that's also why even if it's harder for people with visible or invisible disabilities or class issues and or parents or whatever the thing is that makes it hard, if we can write, it's incredibly important. And this I do feel I actually, especially since I was diagnosed, as you know, autistic a couple of years ago, I just feel like incumbent on me to talk from that perspective now because it's like I need I just feel like, well, I have this privilege, I'm a writer, so I'm going to use that privilege for good, hopefully, you know, and make it clear that this is not what people think it is, you know, and and, and, mm -hmm. I, and whatever that happens to be for anybody, that's not the only, that's just my thing right this minute, right. but like, there's all of these things and places that, like, you're writing from a queer perspective, and, you know, all these other perspectives that you bring into it, um, you know, and a Jewish identity, which is very mm -hmm. important to your stuff, too, which I think is beautiful, and, and the intergenerational trauma of that, and just all of those things that you bring in are so unique to you, and, and yet, you know, I feel like even if we have unique things that come, disabilities, different identities, different things, that what makes it what what I hope any of us are doing is making it visible to people so it, it enlarges the idea of what's human. It's not mm -hmm. like, oh, here I am in my patch and you can't understand me, but it's like, okay, can we enlarge this? Can mm -hmm. we make this a bigger table? What is that idea? If there's not enough room in the table, make a bigger table. So right. it's, you know, so I do feel like we have a bit of a, a responsibility, to be honest. Yeah, I can understand that. Um... Oh, sure. Should, wait, are we doing yeah. questions? No, you yet? can do. Yeah, Laura, okay. this is a good question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Laura, for that question. Um, and I'm sure Julia can speak to this as well. Um, so I am chronically ill um, and have been, I mean, I have a genetic condition. I'm also chronically ill, but now that I have an actual diagnosis, it's, you know, more specific to say that I have a, a genetic condition um, that I was born with. And, um, so I've had like chronic pain for many, many years. Um, you know, since I was a teenager, basically, I've had uh, joint pain and muscle aches for seemingly no apparent reason. Um, my uh, and I've had migraines since I was about uh, since I was about six. Um, and and so these are things that because I'm also very active, like I walk a lot for for my mental health. I take walks. I I really need to be in motion. Um, it, it makes my, it's like what, it's what makes my body feel good. Um, and because I'm able to do that and because I walk a lot, you know, it, 
there is this sense in which I don't look disabled, right? Um, I spent a lot of years working um, three jobs in New York. One of them was at the workspace that Julie mentioned before. Uh, I was like a part-time office manager there. I was part-time working for an agent. Then I was also doing freelance work on top of that. Um, I was starting to do criticism. So three or four jobs sort of depending on how you count it. Um, and, you know, people said to me a lot at the time, you do so much. That's so amazing. Wow. You do so much. And people said that to me for years. Like people still say to me how amazing it is that I work so much. And the trouble is that like, I've worked so much in part, you know, cause I had to, um, because like, I didn't manage to find a full-time job with benefits. Um, so I cobbled together this other thing, but also in part, because I kept trying to prove that I wasn't limited right, which I've, I've heard from a lot of people who have come to terms with their disability sort of a little later in life or become open about them or spoken about them more later in life than when they were like very young, um, that this is pretty common, that like a lot, especially with invisible disabilities, you keep trying to prove to everybody that you're fine, you're great, and so you do a lot because it's also to prove to yourself, right, that you're not going to be slowed down by your disability, you're not going to be, you know, and, and I think for many of us, it's also like a, um, a uh, what is the word, it's like a coping mechanism, right, because if I can, if I can do, you know, if I can write 50 reviews this year, then I'll have proved somehow something to someone, I don't know to who, I don't know what it is I'm proving, it just feels like I'm constantly trying to prove myself, you know, um, and so I think that invisible disabilities are just a real mind trip because because they're not visible and because things like chronic pain are very difficult to talk about because there's no I mean, there's no metric, right? Like I can't show you here's like like I sometimes wish I had like a bar, you know, like some kind of bar on my wrist that just would go up on bad pain days so I can show people like, look, it's at red right now. Give me a break. Right. Um, but there isn't like one of the things that's very fucked up pardon my language but true is that if i have a really there's a specific kind of migraine i get that makes the vein a vein that i have right up here pop out a little and every time i have that kind of migraine i'm like yes there's visible proof that i have a migraine <laughs> which is very silly because like again i don't know who i'm trying to prove this to um, doctors really because so many i spent a long time and i know julia you've experienced this as well of a long time of trying to get doctors to like figure out what's wrong with me and them not doing so. Um, so I think that's really probably where that's coming from. Um, but yeah, uh, if there's anything or more specific that you wanted me to talk about, Laura, I'm happy to. Um, oh, sure. <laughs> what I take for migraines. Oh my gosh. Um, it, it has changed. I, I have learned that I'm not alone and that migraine medication seem to stop working for me after two to three years. Um, currently, I take risotriptan, 10 milligrams. That's like the rescue medicine um, that, uh, you know, is starting to not work for me. But I also do the injections now. I, I like not not Botox, which is maybe the next thing that I'll have to try for the migraines, not for appearances. But um, I take an injection called Emgality, which is a once a month and is supposed to be a preventative. And Eh. So I've yet to find anything that really works properly. Um, but also because I've had migraines for so long, I unfortunately do, there, there's very rarely a migraine that I can't work through, <laughs> that I can't just continue doing. I mean, I'm uncomfortable, but I just, you know, my light sensitivity and my auras are not like that bad. So I'm able or I have taught myself really how to just sort of push through a lot of my pain out of necessity. Yeah, I, I really relate to that, even though I don't have the physical pain issue. Um, what I, I, I've just found out recently, I'm finding out a lot about autistic masking, which obviously I did a lot of, which is why I never knew I was until I was 57. <laughs> but, uh, and also because girls and women present differently, blah, blah, blah. But also, one of the, and I didn't realize this was masking, is workaholism. And I was like, of course, because like you, that's exactly what I did is I just worked my ass off. And I didn't know what I knew. And I kept saying to myself over the last, 
I don't know, 10 years or so, or maybe more, 10 or 20 years. I don't know when the wheels are going to come off this cart. And I didn't even know what wheels or what cart. <laughs> you know, So it's a different kind of invisible disability, but it's it's interesting how both can manifest in and that proving yourself thing. Oh, my God. You know, and I, I've, I've been joking about this with people recently, too. I'm like, what am I even proving? Like who to who to what? You know, because I and, and yeah, partly it's doctors, partly it's this or that or, you know, and you've probably had this one of the things with autistic people, and I'm sure in your case too, is like certain medicines don't work the way they're supposed to. And if I had a dollar for every time somebody said, nobody else has that reaction to this medication, I would be a rich person, you know? And it's like, and that's what well, that doesn't even include the long haul COVID piece, which is a whole other drama, you know? And it's just like, when you get into these things, it's incredible. Uh, and, and, it, it, and yet what I just really keyed off on, regardless of the specificity differences is, that I think of I'm going to work, you know, I'm going to keep doing it. And one thing I'll tell you now, I'm 59, <laughs> about to turn 60, believe it or not, weird, um, is, uh, you know, it stops where I, you, you, you just can't keep up the same level. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm only 32, but I'm already, I can't, I mean, and I think the pandemic is part of it, but like, I can't work now the way that I did up to my late 20s, you know? Yeah. Well, the, the, you'll find there's energy. This is what I found is there's energy dips. Like the first energy dip is around 28. That's the first one. And then there's another one at 35. Another, they're about seven years apart. And then there's another one. Interesting. I've never heard that. Well, I don't know if it's official, but it's what I've seen. And then I've talked to other people. It's just anecdotal, to be honest. I have a lot of anecdotal evidence based on my experience and other people's. But I just want to quickly say I've made it so people can unmute if you want to either raise your hand physically or a little yellow hand, or you just want to come in if you want to ask Alana or me a question or just make a comment. Um, if you If we tried to answer a question or something and it didn't quite, if you want to add to that, uh, you can come in now. Laura, yeah, come on in. You just got to unmute yourself. Thanks. Yeah, there you go. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for your work. I uh, I can't wait to read. I actually want my uh, my synagogue book club to uh, to read it. <laughs> yes, I'm. I do book clubs with synagogues sometimes. Yes. So if you want me to come, Yay. let me know. <laughs> I was afraid to ask. All right, it probably won't be till the fall because we're totally we have our schedule. Um, anyway, I, I think I understand the, as someone who's very late diagnosed with autism, you know, like Julia age, which is how I know I'm wonderful Julia. Uh, <laughs> I, I understand the need to, to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And I, I, you know, I, no one wants to be other. I mean, that's, that's my feeling. And I don't know if you have a response to that. I mean, I think it's not okay. It's, it isn't okay to be not okay. Yeah. Oh, I mean, right. I mean, I think, I think that's the real thing in this country, especially is like, we're happy obsessed, right? Like, like this country is really obsessed with happiness. Um, not with like mo experiencing moments of joy, not with experiencing, you know, the ecstasy that is, some aspects of human experience, but specifically this kind of flat, constant happiness. You have to be okay, right? Um, and yeah, and it's hard to publicly not be okay, but I also think that, I, I honestly think that of all the terrible things that COVID has done, one small saving grace um, is that, um, uh, is, is the fact that a lot more people are talking about not being okay because for a while everybody wasn't okay in a way that was kind of similar. And then some people started being super okay. And some of us were still like, eh, still not okay. Um, but there's been more room for the discourse about it, I think. And uh, Kat, that is awesome. I've been uh, toying with an idea of writing a, an essay called Against Happiness. So um, I'll probably have to read this as well. <laughs> Yeah, and I just want to say quickly before you come in again, Laura, what Nanita wrote is really important. Um, I, oh, I love that. That's a great. I haven't read that book, but thanks, Catherine, called Fuck Happiness. Wonderful. But I just want to read what Nita wrote, right? Whenever I voice and I'm not okay, manic depression and terminal heart disease, I'm shushed. Just do what the doctors say and you'll be just fine. I think that's super important um, because I think it is, again, it's that idea that 
and that's where the disability and mortality piece come together, right? It's like, don't tell me, you know, about something that's out of my control, like manic depression or bipolar, whatever it's called this week. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? I know you know, Anita, that's why I'm joking. We know each other well enough that I can say this just so you know, just I think I'm being horribly rude. Please note she's laughing. Anyway, <laughs> um, so, you know, that, that whole thing. Uh, and then also just like, don't tell me you're dying because I don't want to fucking know. Like it used to be, I think this is where much better. It used to be when people had cancer, they couldn't even tell anyone because they're like, people thought like it was catching or something, you know, um, and, and that has changed somewhat, but vulnerability, I think you're right about the happiness thing. Cause it, I don't think it's real happiness. I think it's this narrow, it's like neutral, uh, that came about, um, you probably, are, you were probably too young to remember this, but Saturday night live when Prozac became the thing that everybody had in the early nineties, they, Lorraine Newman and Jane Curtin did this hilarious thing about like, well, my husband's leaving me and I'm about to become homeless, but I'm fine. And, you know, and it was just like everybody was talking about these disasters and like, oh, but it's OK, I'm on Prozac, you know, and, and there is that sort of thing of like, we're just going to drug you. And it's just another version of the whole Valium thing that my grandmother Janie had to get off of. Like, here, have this, have this, have this, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. That's what some people don't need. I'm not saying, but like, just saying well, that's the complicated element. thing, right? There's yes. like, on the one hand, we want to use pills to fix people. But on the other hand, we don't, well, A, we don't test those pills always on anybody Ooh. other than white men, um, which exactly. is like insane. Um, but also that like like the opioid epidemic right like now mm -hmm. doctors simply do not want to prescribe opiates to anyone ever right. and that is a problem for a lot yes. of chronic pain patients exactly. for whom opiate opiates are like really useful so like it's yeah. it's yeah there is there is no medicine without politics in this country unfortunately no true true um nina i noticed you're unmuted did you want to ask a question or say something and then i'll go back to you laura just wanted to get new people in if that's okay yeah um, no, I really, um, I've really enjoyed this. However, um, as a prescriber, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. So I prescribe a lot of antidepressants and um, a lot of medications. And I just have to jump in and say, they can be lifesavers. Totally can be lifesavers. Oh, they are. Um, Absolutely. Sorry. So I'm I glad you're saying this. I always have to say that um, I'm a very careful prescriber. I'm a very good listener. Um, I get a lot of people who have been treated for decades and are on so many medications and trying very hard to cut back on some of them safely. So I, I, I just felt like I really did have to, to jump in. And I really love what you're talking about with the disability. I was always fairly healthy outside of, you know, anxiety and depression and migraines, which were always very manageable. I'm a very lucky person, um, sober for like 43 years. But I was recently, um, well, <clears throat> about five years ago, was diagnosed with a chronic condition. And it, and it knocked me, completely knocked me off my feet because I you had no idea. I was, I, I, I'm a treater, not somebody who needs treatment. And so I just love hearing the, the dialogue that people are having now about disability and getting it out there. It took me years before I could share it with anybody except people very close to me. And um, so I just really have enjoyed this, um, this, I, I can't remember what you call it, but this reading and this conversation. So thank you. Yeah, Virtu thank you. Virtual Nina. author coffee chats. Sorry. Okay. Yes. <laughs> no, Alana, please, substantive oh, answer, please. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's just I just wanted to say like absolutely they are. I mean, this is this is part of the trouble, right? Is that I feel like a lot of these conversations really want to make it a black and white thing. Like there was recently a kerfuffle a, a, an online kerfuffle of, about um a, a, an otherwise a mental health writer that I really like who talks a lot about sort of the systemic reasons for mental illness, right? Like the reasons why we're depressed and anxious more than ever before. Um, and they, they sort of wrote, they wrote this piece about that was sort of like against antidepressants that took a lot of work from like anti-psychiatry activists and sort of didn't disclose that. So that was an issue because like there is, there's some, there's a lot of interest groups, you know, always. There is no, there's nothing that doesn't have politics attached to it. But 
I think the problem is that the nuance is what we really need to have, right? Like the nuance between, it doesn't have to be all the medications or no medications and that's all, right? Like I know myself that when I last tried to go off medication, it was a horrible, horrible idea. And I got into a horrible relapse and had the worst depressive episode I've had in years. And when I got back on it, like so quickly, I felt better. So for me, I know it is absolutely life-saving, you know, but I also feel like I have, I have been seen by nurse practitioner, by psychiatric nurse practitioners who unlike you didn't want to talk to me. Like they just wanted to give me medication and so that I could leave. And that problem is not even necessarily, you know, they're, that's probably not even what they want to do. It's that they have, because of the way the medical system is set up, they have three and a half minutes with each patient. And if they don't meet their quotas, then, you know, so as always, I think nuance is the key to any conversation around medication of any kind, really. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you guys both brought that up. I'm really happy. Um, I just, I know we've only, we're technically out of time, but Laura, did you have a quick question or something you wanted to say? Because I don't want to keep Alana past um, the time. I don't know how long she has. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. As someone who's on psychotropics and is about to have knee replacement and looking, you know, counting on those opioids. Yes, I'm all in favor. Um, the thing that I was going to say before, <laughs> and, you know, and also that you know, as we were bringing up the role of of race and class in in treatment, and how about those people who don't have any access to psychotropics or migraine medication or anything like that? I mean, this country and around the world. Okay, absolutely. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about is productivity. And, you know, something that is very important in this country. And if you're not producing, 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 you know, you're lazy, you know, you have a moral problem, stuff like that. And how um, I feel the need to, to push back against that. So I, think I think that's, oh, sorry, Laura. Go ahead. Sorry, Laura, I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought you were done, but I just realized I should have waited a second. I thought I was done too, thanks. <laughs> okay, so we both thought you were done. Um, no, I, I just agree with that. And actually that's one of the things that I am realizing I'm about to go on a sabbatical to work on my writing, uh, which is thanks to the government and a small business loan because I live in a shitty neighborhood that they gave me. So <laughs> like I'm making it into an art grant. But I, you know, my first impulse was like, I'm going to go and work on that, you know, and it was like, no, I'm going to go and sleep for a while, you know, and then I'm going to work because it's like that, you know, I need that. That's just as important as I'm finally beginning to realize as I let go of the mask, the workaholic mask and proving to who knows who the fuck I'm proving anything to person thing that you mentioned, Alana, you know, it's like that, like, I have to prove my worth, you know, and, and it's just as I, as I begin to let that go, it's just incredible because I feel like very gradually I'm coming back to being a human being again. And I lost that somewhere along the way. You know, so uh, Robin, did you have something? You should, Lana's willing to stay for 10 more minutes. So do you okay. have something? You'd I like just to wanted to talk about the issues that so many of us in this group seem to be dealing with one way or another is uh, some sort of chronic illness or chronic whatever. And um, I've been dealing with mine for a long time and overtly for tw over 20 years now. That's both pain and fatiguing. And I know it was it's it still is for me very hard to find balance. I mean, it's that mythical thing called balance. And if you know, you were saying if doctors say to you one more time, but I've never heard anybody react like that. Well, if I get one more time of anybody uh, saying to me, just feel that find your balance. And that's not easy to do. Um, it's a myth. I mean, I suppose if I were a bodhisattva and living in a nice, comfortable monastery somewhere uh, with very, I don't know, even there, you've got, you've, we've got responsibilities. And, and, and there's also things I want to do. And I don't mean by want to do anything well, there's my creative side, but there's also, I'd like to have a social life. I'm an introvert, which is surprising for a lot of people to know, but my outward thing with people, which I enjoy is also very depleting for me. 
And yet I want to have, we know now that isolation is ki literally kills people, particularly as we get older and I'm turning 80 shortly. So, you know, you've got those issues and uh, there are dishes to wash and laundry to do and bills to pay. And, and yet when I take a day or part of a day and lie on the couch, I feel guilty, even though I know I shouldn't feel guilty. But, you know, um, and I have been reamed for trying to do something with somebody else and then collapsing. It's like, it's my fault. Well, I understand I do have a certain amount of responsibility. I've been dealing with this for a long time. And I know if I do X, if I put out a lot of on X, that Y is probably going to happen and I'm going to crash. But sometimes the X is really important to me and I just have to build in the crash um, and, and so that I can do X. I just can't do X day after day after day. Um, so I just, you know, balance is, it's, it's like said, being mindful. It's very easy to say. And it's a very difficult practice and one I try to do with regularly. And sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't. Anyway. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things that I have, one of my favorite things that I've learned from uh, those who have lived more life than me is that no, you will never find the balance. You just have to learn how to be okay with that. <laughs> that's the real, that's the real thing, I think, is the learn how to be okay with the shitty nature of the world we live in enough to be able to do the things that you want to do right but yeah i is there a balance i have yet to find anybody who has really managed to master it <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you yeah. no i, oh, I, I love that cat yeah that is great did you want to cut did you want to say something? Um, I mean, I'm loving your comments. You don't need to say anything out loud, but if you wanted to, we have a minute. But okay, all right, no thanks. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. It's just you've been putting all these great comments, so I just wanted to make sure you knew that there was possibility. Um, yeah, yeah, no, what she wrote is my yoga training told me that balance isn't fixed, but a constant state of motion, which is absolutely true, which is why it's so hard to find all the time. I also I'm a yoga teacher as well. And, you know, uh, in fact, I'm convinced that that training I got right before the pandemic is the reason I survived COVID and long COVID and my time in the hospital and all the things, because I had a bunch of tools, you know, um, and I had a couple of people who kept reminding me of them and used them. And um, throughout all of the time when people didn't really know what long COVID was, and I was talking to doctors who were I mean, one of my doctors, the best doctor I had, vascular neurologist, who has been amazing all along. And she said, uh, I was talking to her in August, and she said, you know, in April, we were looking at each other. This is a Columbia Presbyterian, you know, world-class doctor <laughs> saying, is everything we learned in medical school wrong? <laughs> they were, that's literally what they were saying to each other. They were so freaked out. They did not know what was going on. And how could they? You know, they were building a plane while they were flying it. So, like, who does that? And uh, what I learned is exactly what you said, Kaz, is like that. So what I kept doing is shifting and changing what I did. And, and uh, everyone I dealt with would say to me, you yoga people, thank God. Like they were so like, they were actually very affirmative. All the people I talked to about what I was doing, not that it's the only way or the only thing, it's like, you need all kinds of interventions, but it's amazing when you have, even though it doesn't mean I don't have perfect balance by anybody's even beginning far stretch, but it gave me tools, um, incredibly important tools, I think, that saved my life, to be honest, you know, mm -hmm. so. And sometimes you just have to go in there and figure it out yourself, because at least so far for me, like pretty much every chronic medical thing I've ever had, no doctor's ever been able to sort it out. <laughs> so I've had to figure it out myself one way or the other. And yeah. I mean, these are good people. These are good. It's not. It's just, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. So anyone else have a last question or comment? Or Alana, do you want to say anything? In, in, in... I just want to thank you both for being here. This I want to thank wonderful. all of you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Julia, again for having me.
Yeah, no, it's been great. And and I'm just glad we connected back in the day, which is, seems like so long ago. It's only 2016, but it seems like 9,000 years ago right now because of pandemia. Um, but yeah, and uh, just that, you know, again, I'm just going to say about Alana, and you definitely should read her book. And, you know, it's like that, say, so six years ago, you were in your mid 20s, and I mm -hmm. was in my early 50s, and we got along. And that says a lot about you, you know, I mean, I, I mean, maybe also because I taught people <laughs> younger, but I mean, I think hopefully it's both of us, but you know, not every, it's interesting how ageism kicks in really fast uh, with people. And, and I never got that from you. And um, well, thank that. you. I've always had people who are older than me to look up to. And, you know, I believe very much in intergenerational relationships sort of in general, you know, I think they're really important. Um, and, you know, as a queer person, I've always, I've, I've learned so much from my queer elders, you know what I mean? And, and it yeah. feels so, so important in this particular, in that particular community that doesn't always have a direct lineage of any kind, you know, to, to uplift and understand the, the lineage we do have. Yeah, I agree. And I, you know, I came from a lineage of my mother, who you were just talking to and her mother, Janie, and, you know, a feminist lineage that goes back quite a ways. And her mother, her, 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 her mother, my great grandmother was also like, did this whole genealogy of the women in our family for 10 generations. Like she found out we were related to the sister of some constitution guy, whatever. I mean, just like kind of this sort of like, you know, those kind of things are amazing that people, and they all, you know, all, you know, fought for it, you know, fought for that ability. And, uh, and even if it's imperfect, like we all are, you know, it's amazing to see that, you know, to see those lineages. And um, as you know, I grew up with a lot of gay people too. So I have that lineage in mind and then saw what AIDS did and all the things. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, I keep saying it's interesting because there's a real relationship between autistic uh, treatment and gay conversion therapy. And these were the same people that created both, you know, and, and so the idea to make autistic kids look normal is the same people who created gay conversion therapy, you know, and, and yet that's still normalized. So I'm still sitting around waiting for the autistic stonewall. I'm just like, I'm not sure precisely what that's going to look like, whether we just turn off the internet one day or something. I'm not really sure. What, what, but like, you know, I, I, I keep hoping that that visibility will occur. Um, but yeah, so. Yeah, that's All fascinating. Right. I hope you write more about that, about that connection, because I've never, I never knew that those were connected, those treatments. I didn't either until I read uh, Steve Silverman's Brilliant Neurotribes. Um, oh, and, okay. uh, you know, he's he's gay, but not uh, autistic. But he wrote this incredible and he wrote, uh, yeah, it's going to be in my I'm not sure precisely. I'm still working on this memoir is is a bit of a, a thing, <laughs> but it's going to include that stuff because it's really important. Because like when I was coming up, uh, I just couldn't have been diagnosed or if I had been, it would have been a shit show because there was nothing good that came from that, you know, so it's also that thing of the, you know, the need to mask and I'm sure in different generations with gay people it's the same it's like shit I can't be that you know even if you didn't even know what that was it's just like this like I can't be who I am because there's something's wrong and it's not going to go well for me you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then there are huge ramifications right of course, and so of course. I'm just so glad that it's shifting, you know, very gradually, but it's shifting for gay people, thank God, and hopefully for autistic people. And I noticed this is the other thing about generations, uh, millennials and Gen Z, you know, you get it's the younger people that understand it better than older people in my, like, I've had harder conversations with friends that are older who are just like, wait, what? Like, and younger people are way more accepting. So it's really interesting to see that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank yeah. you, Julia. Thanks, Alana. Thank thank I'm so glad. Much. And just, I'm just gonna just show a picture of the book again. All, all my mother's lovers, you should read that. If for some reason you haven't read the mortality shot, asking you to read that too. <laughs> uh, but you know, this is the new one, so here we go. And um, thank you so much, Alana. And I will thank now you. turn turn off the recording.